before I start, um, you can actually see by the title, it's an overview of progressive edition lenses and hence on solving progressive associated uh, problems associated with uh, wearers. Now, before I start, we're going to do a bit of basic optics. Now, this is bringing back the past. Those who had me for optics, uh, it's bringing back the past, and this is exactly what I'm going to do now, just to give you an overview of basic optics before we actually get into um, progressive lenses. Now, if you go back to second and third year study of simple optics and apply that to PALs, it will make your job that much easier. Now, you might be thinking second and third year study, why? In fact, it's got to do with everything. Now, we're going back to basics. Plus and minus lenses. Huh? No, it's changing. Oh, okay. Uh, simple plus and minus lenses. We know that uh, plus lenses magnify. We know that minus lenses minify. And when you get magnification, you get a smaller field of view. With um, minus lenses, your field of view is larger. Now, you may be asking, so, what's this got to do with progressives? Well, it's to do with your field of view through your corridor, and it's also got to do with your corridor width. Um, if you're going back to, like, uh, with your plus and minus lenses. Is this something I can point to? I can't. Okay. Maybe we like that. Does the cursor? Yes, the cursor. Oh, there. Okay. Right. Let's go back to chromatic aberration. Now, we know that low index materials, the chromatic aberration is less. High index materials, your chromatic aberration is much greater. Now, just to refresh your memory, when we talk about chromatic aberration, it's a split between your, um, your, your red and your blue light as it passes through your lens. Now, with low index materials, you can see here theta A is much smaller than theta B, which is a high index material. And you can see now low index materials have less chromatic aberration and your high index materials have a, a more chromatic aberration and of course with a lower Abbey value. You know, you determine the quality of the lens by the Abbey value. Now you might be thinking, so what's this got to do with progressives? Where this comes into play is when you change a person from a low index to a high index. They might just experience more chromatic aberration and it may be a problem. So these are just things to look out for when you consider changing lens materials. Next thing, hyperopes. If a person is wearing single vision lenses, hyperopes, and if they look to read, they are going to converge much more, as you can see over there, if this is your actual position of your object, light will uh, diverges from the object through the lens, you now get a base out effect which displaces the object further in. So in other words, actual object, as you can see where it is, where the apparent position is much closer. So looking through uh, plus lenses when you're reading, and you're looking off center, your convergence is slightly greater. And in the case with lenses of negative power, the opposite happens. Light will diverge from the object, bend towards the base, and image is displaced slightly further. So what's this telling you? Your convergence here is much less. And how does that affect everything? It affects your corridor insets. Now, just to explain a bit here what we mean by corridor insets, if you look at a normal power there of plus 50 with an error plus 2, that can be your normal inset between distance and your near focusing. That's your convergence, basically. Now, if you take a higher power in plus with an add of two, that inset over there, you can see over here, is much larger. And this is incorporated into the progressive lens. We can go over there now, minus three with the two add. You can see the convergence there is going to be much less compared to a plus of 50 with the three add, that convergence is slightly larger because of your add. So as you can see, the, the higher the plus, the greater the, the, the inset. 
And when it comes to designing lenses, the lens manufacturer will design the lens according to your prescription and your ad power. Now, these progressive lenses and near zones are always to the right position in front of the eye. So this is basically uh, the right eye of each lens. Right, let's take the case of hyperopes. When they look down to read, actual object um, is here in the green, but after passing through the lens, that image is displaced downwards. So you have, your apparent position is slightly lower. And in the case of myopes, it's exactly the opposite. Actual object is placed there, but after looking through, you incorporate in a base down effect and it displaces um, the image of that object slightly higher. Now the same thing applies. What's the importance of this? Well, it may seem to suggest that um, myopes prefer shorter corridors and hyperopes prefer longer corridors. I don't know if you've ever been to any of these presentations where um, the presenter will make a statement as far as um, what I've just mentioned over here, where myopes prefer shorter corridors and hyperopes prefer longer. Uh, the way I see it is, it's probably because of what's happening there when they look down. Now, in the case of anisometropia. Now, if you look in the case of anisometropia, you've got a plus lens in your right, minus lens in the other. Now, your displacement is in the opposite direction. Now, when it's in the opposite direction, obviously, what's going to happen? You're going to get a, a, a displacement in the opposite direction, and that could cause double vision. Now, I can imagine you people listening over here or thinking, how does this all apply to progressive lenses? Each and everything that I've discussed here, we're going to go through an example, and it's all going to apply. Now, we come to the basic uh, optics of progressive lenses. We all know that um, softer designs uh, have slightly narrower corridors compared to harder designs, except that your harder designs have more peripheral distortions. And corridor width versus add power, you're all familiar that um, lower ads uh, have wider corridors compared to um, higher ads where there's more peripheral distortions on the edges. And of course, your corridor widths are much uh, narrower. Now, this is all basic optics. This is what you learned in second year and third year. So this is more of a refresher. Um, I'm sure most of you know this. But I have to just make mention of all this when it comes to uh, solving problems with uh, progressive lens wearers. Now, what I've done over there, I've just drawn over here uh, with your softer design. The red mark is your width compared to your harder design. Now, that width, where, uh, as you can see with the cursor, is equivalent to the width in your harder design, where your harder design is slightly wider. But of course, the minute you move into the, the peripheral, your distortion is much greater. Now, the same thing applies over here with your low ads. With your, your low ads, that will be the width of your three ad. Now, if you compare it to your low ad, you can see that your low ads are much wider. Now, don't take these um, figures at face value. It's just a guide for clarity, just to show you the differences between your corridor width uh, when compared to ad powers and of course hard designs versus softer designs. Same thing applies over here when it comes to your low ads and low astigmatism. Compared to higher ads, you can see how the astigmatism, uh, oops sorry let's go back here, um, how with your low ad and for example one dot of astigmatism that is what your distortion looks like on the edges compared to uh, a higher ad with twice as much astigmatism. And in the third case over here with the three ad with three times astigmatism, how that all affects the corridor and also the peripheral uh, distortions. <clears throat> Another important thing to remember, oops, sorry, this thing's jumping. 
Another important thing to remember is your conventional lenses, your conventional PALs, or, and this also applies to your, when I say conventional um, freeform designs. They are designed for PDs of approximately 64 millimeters. Now, patients with larger PDs may encounter near problems because the convergence, um, more convergence is required to read at the same distance. For example, at 40 centimeters, when compared to a patient with a much smaller PD, as you can see over here, you've got alpha one versus alpha two. Now, alpha one here has got the wider PD, so there's more convergence required here compared to alpha two, where the PDs are narrower, so there's going to be less convergence uh, at a distance of, uh, let's say, for argument's sake, 40 centimeters. Now we're going to the reference points. These are reference points on the normal PALs. You're all familiar with this. Now you can see your, that's your fitting cross, that's your prism reference point, uh, your near reading area, and the fitting cross generally is between two and four millimeters above your prism reference point. So depending on what uh, progressive lens you're using, that will determine where your fitting cross is. Now, for example, if you had to take your, um, let's say the, the, for example, like um, an amplitude, their fitting cross is two millimeters. It's two millimeters above the prism reference, where the majority of others are normally four millimeters. And it's always important to, when, you, when you're marking up progressives, to have the correct card. So you would know exactly what um, um, progressive lens you're using. And when it comes to marking up, it will just make your markings that much more um, accurate. Now we come to corridor lengths. We go through the same thing again. That's your fitting cross. That's uh, the top of your near uh, reading area. That's your prism reference point. And this is for the right and left eye. So when it comes to corridor lengths, it's usually measured from either the, the fitting cross to the top of the circle, of your near circle, or from the prism reference point to the center of the circle. This is uh, your, your, your corridor um, lengths. Now, don't confuse corridor lengths with fitting heights. Um, why I say that is because sometimes you may confuse the two. When you take a corridor length of, let's say, 16 millimeters or whatever, sometimes you may confuse that with your height from your uh, fitting cross to the center of your, um, of your circle over here. And in my opinion, I think that's personally too low because you're cutting out half your reading. But what you'll find is with um, a lot of the manufacturers, what they do, they'll they give a fitting height, but then they'll also give you the minimum fitting height, which is slightly lower. So well, all I'm saying is my opinion. If I get a frame where I see that that fitting cross is going to fit like that, I'd rather choose, a, I'll choose another frame or alternatively, I'd go for a shorter corridor. So that the measurements, in my opinion, if I can get that full circle in the frame, sorry, if I can get that full circle in the frame, personally, I feel that the person will have um, a, a wider reading area. Now, when we get to corridor lengths, now some companies have between four to six different corridor lengths. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, don't confuse your corridor length with your fitting height. So if you get a corridor length, this is jumping. If you get your corridor length of uh, 10 millimeters, if you now look at your fitting height, add either two or four millimeters to that length. So if your corridor length is, for example, is 10 millimeters, your fitting height should be minimum 14 millimeters or 12 millimeters, depending on where your fitting cross is relative to your prism reference point. And the same thing applies to all of these. A 12 millimeter corridor length, 
39 out of 14 or 16, depending on your, um, your reference point from your fitting cross to your um, prism reference point. But the same thing will apply to all of them. 18 millimeters minimum, 22 millimeters or 20, depending, as I mentioned before. So don't confuse corridor lengths with fitting heights. Now, just going back to uh, free form. Free, oh. <laughs> free form is a manufacturing process, not a design. And uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. And not all free form are custom design. Now, if you take a normal free form design, the difference between a conventional and a free form is that your free forms can probably iron out more peripheral distortions, whereas with your conventionals, they have a fixed front surface geometry where it is fixed. When it comes to your free form, they can put eight toric back surfaces on. And um, the good thing about free form, um, that is your um, keeping your, 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 your stock is going to be much less because you don't have to keep different base curves, add powers, right eyes and left eyes. They've just taken ordinary um, single bridge and lens and uh, they can generate uh, progressive lens on it. Um, and of course, not all are, are, are custom designed, but they are available upon request. Now, what I mean by custom design, that means if you want a progressive lens mainly for near, that means they can design your near area to be wide but you're going to compromise your intermediate or your distance. If you want a wide distance, you're going to compromise your intermediate or your near. And the same thing applies. If you want a wide intermediate, you're going to compromise your distance and your near. So where you are uh, correcting on the one area, you're going to compromise on the other. But they are available upon request. Right, now a few considerations before PALS. And I think a lot of people, why they get so many comebacks, I think they're selecting the wrong patient or they're selecting it for the wrong occupation. Now the most important thing that I find where I get a lot of success, because I take all of these things into account and I'm sure you people do the same. Most important is your patient selection. Not everyone is a good candidate for uh, a progressive. You've got to sum your patient up and see now, will he be a good candidate or not? You've got to determine um, his occupation, obviously. That's, um, you can see if he needs wide reading areas or whatever. And when I say age and ad power, obviously the older you are, the higher the ad power. Now, if it's higher the ad power, that means your corridors are narrower. So it's important to educate your patient properly. You know, often you get, um, uh, and I've seen this, clinicians, they don't educate their patient properly. They say to their patients, right, you get clear vision at all distances, but what they fail to mention is peripheral distortions, and what they fail to mention is head movement. Half your problem over here, I can tell you right now, you educate your patient properly, you'll know what to expect. And you don't ever hand your um, glasses out over the counter or let someone else come and collect them. He's got to be educated before and when he comes and collects. Because I've seen patients before in practices where they'll come back complaining. After discussing with them what their problems are, half the time is they have not been educated properly. And after educating them properly and explaining, Sometimes you get away with it and they'll say, okay, I'll try it out. On other occasions, they'll say, no, I've been educated and they're just not for me. But the important thing here is patient selection and educate your patient. <clears throat> right, now it comes to accuracy of measurements. And I'm basing this on a, on a lot of experience that I've seen. And that is, if you want to have success, you've got to make sure that your monocular PDs are accurate. Your measurements have to be accurate. Proper frame fitting, 
make sure that when you take the measurements of your PDs and all that, it's measured in the position the patient is going to wear it. Now, and also use the patient's normal head posture. Don't straighten the person's head if he's got a head tilt, because you're going to pick up problems. Measure up with his normal head tilt, his normal posture. Make sure the PDs are measured accurately, and same thing with pantoscopic tilt and the correct vertex distance. Now, nothing here is new to you. I'm sure most of you do this. But for those of you who are a bit careless, take special note and just be a bit more careful when it comes to measurements. And this, of course, what takes me on to these measurements. Now, I've got four measurements over there. Do they, by any chance, look familiar to any of your measurements? Now, if you see the top right-hand one, you just see two big blobs. Now, if you see over there, those blobs are so thick, where do you measure it from? Second of all, those measurements are too high. You need at least 8 to 10 millimeters above the fitting cross. So rule number one, I'll change the frame. I wouldn't even use that frame. Second of all, with measurements like this, now you send that to the lab and you say, please match to my dots. Where are they going to match it? Where do they match it to? They might say, right, PD 65. But now when you measure from blob to blob, you might get PD 61 or maybe even PD 70. It's so ambiguous. Keep your measurements as accurate as possible. There's another one over here. I don't know if you've ever seen this. Now, you might think I'm exaggerating. I can tell you I am not. Measure your PD. From what dot are you going to measure it from? Is it from the thick dot to the thin dot or whatever? Now, you people are looking at me and probably thinking, oh, man, I'm exaggerating. I'm talking nonsense. Let me tell you, it's not. If you're marking up like this, I can tell you right now, you know who you are. Right, look at that one over there. Would you say it's a good measurement as far as I'm concerned? No, it's not. Uh, is this cursive? As far as I'm concerned, these measurements are too low. You've got all this excess area here. Yeah, as far as I'm concerned, this is a badly fitted frame. I'll choose another frame so you can at least lift these centers. The way I see this over here, these measurements are going to be too low. Now, if we go to the last one over there, now those measurements are, more, are the most accurate. They're very concise. You can actually see and you can measure properly. Now, I know what uh, a lot of clinicians do. They mark their dots on the dummies. And then what they do is they send it to the lab and they ask the lab to match according to the measurements on the dummies. That's fine. But the only problem is, do they take the measurements of those markings on the dummies? Because when the job comes back, those markings are there. And if they haven't recorded any measurements, how would you know if you are wrong or if the lab made the mistake? Always record your measurements, and when it comes back from the lab, and if the arm are knocking the measurements, make sure they are accurate according to your measurements. And if there are any comebacks and um, the lab is correct, then it's your mistake. So it's always good to keep record keeping, especially when it comes to these uh, markings. I can tell you one thing. Half the problems with progressive lenses is incorrect markings. They blame the lens, but it's not the lens. As far as I'm concerned, I think it's the clinician because the markings aren't good or they are selecting the wrong patient. I'm getting a very sarcastic remark from Belinda over here. Right, now here are some common errors. Now you might be looking at this and saying the same thing again. Oh, man, what's he talking about? These are now common mistakes that you make. Look at the top over here. If you look at these measurements, what do you notice about these measurements? The eyes are looking to the left. And in this case over here, the eyes are looking to the right. Clinician is not aligned properly with the patient. That's why you land up with these funny measurements. Same thing down here in B. 
In this case over here, the patient is too short and the clinician is too high. So that patient is looking up, so you're going to get an incorrect measurement and your markings are going to be too high. Same thing applies over here when uh, the patient is too tall and the clinician is too short. The patient is going to look down and those measurements are going to be too low. So these are just common, um, when I say mistakes, I'm not saying you people do it, not for one minute, but um, in many cases it does happen. You've got to be lined up exactly in line with your patient to get your right measurements. Now, I know many uh, clinicians use pupillometers, which is probably more accurate, but not everyone has a pupillometer. So if you're marking up with marking pens, uh, just be extra careful with your measurements. Because I know the, the first complaint that um, um, clinicians uh, complain about, let's put it to that way, I know these lenses are, are they're useless. But meantime, the markings are incorrect. But just remember, I'm generalizing here. I'm not pointing fingers. Right. After those, that basic introduction to optics and um, uh, marking up and basic optics of progressives, I've got seven case studies. If you have to go, that's fine, because uh, depending. Now, mind you, I've got plenty of time. We've got time to do a few case studies over here, and let's see if you um, can find out what the problems are. Right. Case number, are there any questions that are uh, up to I'm now? Huh? I can't say I'm uh, At the top, you mean? Uh, okay, fine. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Right, we'll keep questions for later if necessary. Okay, right. Patient age 48 years comes to you for an examination. Chief complaint is near vision. Okay, he's 48 years old, so obviously um, he doesn't have progressives or whatever. He's wearing single vision. And we find that uh, right eye plus one minus 150, axis 180, and left eye plus 150 minus 050, axis 180, and vision at that stage is 69, PD 77, quite a big guy, and he's wearing single vision, 54, 24 plastic frame. Now he's complaining about near vision, so you decide right. You retest him and you find this prescription there is at, uh, in fact, his sphere has gone up by half a diopter in both eyes and now he's down to 6.6 six, and he's got an add of 150 and you now decide to give progressive lenses, PD77, pupil height 22. Now this patient is a first time progressive lens wearer. Right. He comes back complaining. Glasses are not comfortable. Glasses cause headaches. Reading, not comfortable. You check the prescription, pentoscopic tilt, and centration of the lenses, and all is correct. So, in fact, your marking up is all correct, and um, now he's got a problem. What are your possible problems? Now, uh, before I uh, show you what I think it is, you are all going to have your own... Um, ideas or whatever as to why you can't see. So, if you were listening carefully to my um, introduction, there's one clue over there. Now, it may be this, but there could be other, there could be other factors involved. So, think it out and possible solutions. Your conventionals are designed for RPDs of 64. Patient has to converge more to see at 40 centimeters, not getting the full benefit of the corridor. So that's probably why he's not seen comfortably at near. He's not getting the full benefit of the corridor. Now, just remember one thing. He, we have not given him the top of the range progressive. We are taking, let's say, an entry level, or if that's what you want to call it, or... Um, He's a budget patient, also he can't afford or whatever. So we're just taking a normal progressive lens. And it's the free form design. Now, if you think about it, what I've just mentioned, that PD is 77, okay? Now, if you think he now has to converge much more than your normal person with a PD of, say, 64. So a possible problem here could be that 
his convergence. He's not reaching the full benefit. And it could be that um, um, he's getting blurred vision and it could be causing headaches. So these are just possibly one of the causes. There might be others. And if there are people in the uh, audience, if you want to call it that, have any other um, options that you may think could be the problem, uh, feel free to mention that, okay? Right. Patient 50 years old, comes for an eye examination for the first time. He's never worn spectacles. Needs a certificate for his driver's license. You examine his eyes and prescribe the following. Sorry, Anthony, for case number one, what would you do? Okay, let's just go back to case number one. Either decenter the distance, what I would do, I would decenter the, the, if we are not going to make high powered lenses, I would decenter the PD, make it a bit closer. I wouldn't give him a PD of 77. I'd probably make it somewhere around probably 73. Uh, so I'm pushing that reading area in. So at least he might be a bit compromised for distance, but at least to make his reading more comfortable. Or go for a better design multifocal. Or maybe go, well, that's, that's yes. another option. Yes, yes, it's another option. Okay. But I'm saying if he, if he comes back, mm. there are other options, but I think the, what we are saying over here is what are the possible problems? There are other ways of, um, of uh, sorting him out, but the thing is you can't sort him out unless you know what the problem is. And if you don't know what the problem is, it's going to make your job that much more difficult. Okay. Right over here, going back to this one, he needs a certificate for driver's license. You examine his eyes, you find the following. Plano minus of 50, 180, 66. Left arm minus 2 minus of 50, axis 180, 66. That's after correction, okay? Obviously, that left eye, he would have had a VA of what? 636 or whatever. Okay, but now you've corrected him to 66. You give him a, a PD-65, of course, you know, you always prescribe transitions ARCs, you know? You know why you do that? Yes. You know why? Uh, I don't know why, but some people just prescribe that, you know? And uh, into a rimless frame, you give him a 1.6 index, and he's got a pupil height of 21, and we're assuming all your markings are correct. Right, patient comes back complaining, Vision is uncomfortable. Sometimes near vision appears distorted and not happy with spectacles. You check the prescription, pantoscopic thought and centration of the lenses, all is fine. What's the possible problem? Uh, what do you say, Belinda? The difference in the prescription. The difference in the prescription, minus Between two. the right and the left eye. Okay, right. Now let the people think a bit. They might all be thinking the same thing. Right, let's see. The patient is monocular. He's been monocular all his life. Okay. He's never worn spectacles. So obviously he's monocular. He did not complain about vision. He came in for the driver's license certificate. Okay. So you've now made him binocular. He cannot get used to the RF because now he's binocular. He's got two different image sizes. All he, all he wanted was a driver's license. So now... He needs, his needs were not properly discussed. You understand what I'm saying? So the, the point of this, the point of this um, uh, example here, oh, sorry, where am I? Sorry, I went the wrong way. Right, the point over here, you've already interpreted that script correctly. Now you can see that he's monocular, obviously he's using his right eye for distance and he's using his left eye for near. Now, this is the important thing when it comes to, uh, first of all, prescribing. Interpret the script properly, and you can anticipate, if you're going to prescribe, what are the possible problems that could happen? And if you discuss everything with him properly, and sorted his needs out, Obviously, you wouldn't have made your 20,000 bucks on his glasses. Now it's going to cost you that money. So I'm just mentioning over here, listen to the patient, look at the script, 
and interpret that script. Okay. Now, some of these uh, might be obvious to some of the, the listeners here, but um, for those who... Um, right. This is case number three. New patient, 50 years old, come for an eye examination. Last test about four years ago. Old RX plus 1 minus 0.75, axis 180, 69, plus 125 minus 1, axis 180, 69, add plus 1, okay? He was wearing transitions, um, but what he was wearing over here, he was wearing uh, single vision. So, obviously, his complaint here is going to be for near. So, you test him over here. And you find plus 150 minus 1, 180, plus 175, 125, 180. And of course, now he needs an ad from here. And of course, we go for transition progressives. Height 66, PD, people are 20, PD 66. He comes back complaining, glasses are not comfortable. More distortions than old glasses. Really not comfortable. Old glasses were more comfortable. You check the prescription, pantoscopic tilt, and centration of lenses, all is fine. So in fact, your markings are good, yeah? So I'm making the assumption that all your markings are good. I'm not going to go through, uh, check this, check that. I'm making the assumption that your markings are good. So these are going to be complaints other than your markings. What are the, pros what are the possible problems? Now look at that script. His old script was plus one there, you add plus one. His new RX now is uh, plus 150. Obviously, um, as he's got older, the ads, the ads increased. He is probably an early press boat there with the plus one ad, because he's now 50, so maybe that was eight years ago or whatever. Now he's complaining. Things aren't comfortable. We were discussing it earlier on. Yes. Right. Obviously, your reading ad has increased. There's more peripheral distortions and narrower corridor. There's not much you can do in a case like that. Patients should have been informed uh, and educated beforehand what the possible problems could be when he gets these glasses. So what I'm saying over here, with your old prescription, your one ad, you've got a wide corridor. Now, first of all, you had a plus script over there. Now you've increased the plus even more in distance and at near. So now you've increased that ad by half a diopter. Now that half a diopter makes a big difference to your corridor width. So now he's probably complaining now because his corridor is not as wide and there's more peripheral distortions. Had you educated the patient beforehand as to what you expect, it would have made your job maybe a bit more easier um, when he came and collected. Because you could always say, yes, I told you that was going to happen and maybe it's more acceptable. You know what I'm saying? Or, or the alternative is for this patient is to go to... Right. If you want to go to alternatives, you could possibly upgrade the lens. But there again, it's costing more money. But you wouldn't know that until you've given in the lens or until you've educated it properly. So just remember, there's more than one option over here. The whole point of this exercise is to be aware of what happens when you change prescriptions and when you change your reading ads. Right? Let's go to case number four. Patient aged 50 years, comes to an eye examination for the first time. Chief complaint is near vision. So he was wearing plus 075 minus 375 axis 180. His new script is plus 150 minus 050 axis 180. And um, as you see, his chief complaint is near vision. He was wearing single vision. So you now decide to check his eyes. Scripts remains the same. You now give him an error of plus 150. You give him progressive lenses, PD 67, Pupil high 22. Okay, there's been some questions. We maybe just go to the chat box. Oh, uh, okay. Should I do this first and then we can do the yes, questions? Yes, yes, let's do that. Is it okay if I do these case studies first and then we can go back to the questions? Would that be okay? Yes, I would be Oh, okay. 
Okay, sorry. Right, we, uh, this one here, yeah, okay, we, uh, okay, so you now give him this script, and his script has stayed the same. Only thing is that you've now given him an ad because he's complaining uh, about near. So that's what you give him. Right, he comes back complaining. Glasses are not comfortable. More distortions than old single vision lenses, which is to be expected. Reading not comfortable, sometimes near becomes distorted. You check prescription, pantoscopic thought, centration of lenses, all is fine. What's the possible problem? Not yet. Think about it before we change. I'm sure a lot of you can pick it up because all what you have to do here is, I'm going back to the same thing, mm -hmm. interpret your prescription. Interpret your prescription. Right. He's a nice metropic by 3.5 diopters in the vertical. Now, if you see over there, you can see the uh, right eye is one diopter in the vertical, left eye is minus 2.25. So now you are, in fact, you're antimetropic. He's got, um, in fact, there's a good chance you might experience double vision. Because if you're looking at the, the power in the vertical meridian, that could be a big problem. Now, if we just go back to the, go back to the slide then. Go back to his height. He's got a height of 22. Okay. I may have exaggerated the height, but for deliberately. <laughs> but go back. Now, if you've, got, if you've got a prescription like that, the further you look down the lens, the more the double vision. So in a case like that, possible solutions, yeah, you could go for a shorter corridor or alternatively go for a smaller frame with a shorter corridor. Or maybe if that doesn't help, you might have to opt for two pairs or maybe a bifocal or something like that. But the point here is try Picture the problem before you prescribe it. Because there's nothing worse than coming back and you don't know how to handle the problem. Now, some of these, uh, what I've given you, I wouldn't quite say they're exaggerated, but these are things that happen in private practice. Okay, let's go to the next one. Right, patient age 60 year old, come for an eye examination. You find that and um, he's wearing plus twos, a plus two add, um, pupil height 18. Okay, you can all read the script over there, progressive with ARC. <laughs> New script now, you can see he's gone up 0.75 in the distance. Uh, Sol has increased by quarter to opta. He's now 6.6. Six. Left R plus 3.25 minus 1. But now, obviously, these glasses must have been quite old because now he's gone up to a 250 add. And you give him a pair of progressive lenses, exactly the same. And of course, now you can see old height 18. Now he's got a height of 16. Right, you prescribe. Comes back complaining, glasses are not comfortable. More distortions than old. Really not comfortable. He has to uh, look right at the bottom of the frame to read, the, to read. Old glasses were more comfortable. You check prescription, of course, your markings and everything is perfect. Uh, what are the possible problems? In your extra plus. I change. You can see now the reading air has increased. More peripheral distortions, which is quite normal, as we all know. He's got a narrow reading area. But now another important thing over there. Look at his pupil heights. He's now got 16. He's got a 16 millimeter, uh, now he's got a, sh a short corridor. And um, if you look over here, no, no, no. Um, you probably find that only half the reading area is sticking out. Now, I know you're going to tell me now that something like 90% of the ad is reached uh, just above the, the circle over there. But that reading area is reduced. He's got a short corridor, more distortions. So that means he's going to have to lift his head up to actually see. In fact, he has to look right at the bottom to read. And there's a problem. Now, in this case over here, we got options over here where we could either uh, fit him into a new frame with a, a longer, slightly longer um, fitting on it. Or in this case over here, when I say upgrade, depending on what you gave him, if you gave him one of these entry levels, um, 
it might be a good idea if you did upgrade him to something more um, that will give him slightly more uh, a softer design, if that's what I'm saying. But now I go back to the same thing. To go back, just to point out certain things over here, that what you must look at, old ad plus two, new ad plus 250. The distance has gone up three quarters of a diopter there, and it's gone up probably half a diopter in the left eye. So you've got much more plus, more magnification, but now you've also given him a shorter corridor. Sorry, over there, a 16 millimeter corridor. Now, if what they say is true, where upper ropes prefer longer corridors and my ropes shorter corridors, you've defeated the whole object here. Now, I'll go back and, I'll, uh, and uh, I'll reiterate what I said earlier on. This is not an exaggeration. This has happened. So it's always a case of interpret your script first. Think of what you're doing. Think of what the change is. And of course, that will help you go on. Right, case number six. Now, this year, okay, let's go through the example quickly first. Um, you prescribe a 50-year-old patient the following. Um, his old, old Rx minus 150 minus 075, left eye minus 150. He was already in ordinary CR39. Now he needs a near pair of glasses. So you test him, he's gone up a bit more in minus to bring him to 6.6. And you decide to give him a one, two, five reading ad. You give him progressives, PD62, and all of that. Now, just before um, I go to the next slide, I don't know if you have the same problem when it comes to myopes. Sometimes they don't always accept progressive lenses immediately, especially when their ads are low. Of course, this is what I found. Now, I don't know if you found the same. Maybe some of you don't have problems, but it's just what I've observed. When it comes to, especially my hopes, that's, they're so used to taking their glasses off to read. Now that you give them a, a progressive, now you limit their field. Although the, 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 the ads are low, somehow they still seem to be bothered with the peripheral. That's, that's what I found anyway, but uh, maybe... Uh, you haven't, I don't know. So let's just go there. He comes back complaining, not comfortable by working on the computer. More distortions than old glasses. Obvious reasons, because you've now given him a progressive. He has to lift his head to see the screen, get a sore neck and, uh, at the end of the day. Old single vision glasses were more comfortable on computer. He says he sometimes takes his glasses off when working on the computer. You check the prescription, pentoscopic tilt, and centration, all is normal. So, in other words, your marking up here is very good. Right. Now, I've got some options over here, which some of you may not agree, but let's just have a look and see. Change, yeah. Now, perhaps the patient was not educated properly about peripheral distortions. Okay, maybe, maybe not, um, but maybe. Single vision readers may have been a better option. Maybe, maybe not. In this case, he'd probably take his glasses off to read, especially because his old glasses was half a diopter weaker. He's probably better off on the computer um, either with his old glasses or taking them off. Perhaps a distance vision only, an old pair for reading the computer. So maybe not giving him a progressive could have been a different option. The patient may have to alter his screen height. Maybe the screen is too high. Perhaps shorter corridor length could be prescribed if the patient cannot work without glasses. Now, let's go back. His old height, now you're giving him a height there of 18. Possible, maybe not. Because I, I find, personally, I find these myopes a bit more difficult in this case. Uh, because you only find out after the event that oh, maybe I shouldn't have given him progressives in the first place. But these are just problems that I have experienced. Uh, go back to the next one. Uh, office intermediate, near bar focals. 
may be a, an alternate option, but um, big question marks. Because what I've done in a case like that, I have, um, I go back, um, patients have said no, they'd rather stick to the old glasses for uh, the computer and they keep the new glasses for distance. But I go back to the point I made over here earlier on, and that is just be aware. You don't always know what the patient is going to experience until you've tried it. But uh, going back to my figure down here, um, where depending on the height, you may find that half the reading is left out, or especially with that height. That's why if you fit in uh, minimum heights, I normally find lift them two millimeters higher, or maybe get a shorter corridor where you're getting the full benefit of the reading. And last of all, this is probably the easiest out of the lot. 65 year old comes to you for an eye test, previously wearing bifocals, needs an eye test, but also needs to see at intermediate distance, last test four years ago. Okay. Now, if you look at this script, whole script plus one minus 050, left eye plus one minus 075, but now look at his VA, 618. New RX minus 150, he's gone up a bit. And of course, now his ad is in, has increased. Now, obviously, there's going to be a reason why his ad has increased. He's looking for intermediate. But now when you do a bit of pathology, you can see he's got mild cataracts. He's got macular degen. And now because of the intermediate, you decide to give him a progressive lens, cigar 20, blah, blah, blah. Right. He comes back, glasses are uncomfortable. Well, to be honest, I wouldn't be surprised. Vision not comfortable, I wouldn't be surprised either. Battling to see clear at intermediate and near. Well, quite normal. Glasses are just not working for him. You check everything, everything is fine. What are the possible problems? This is a simple one. What's the problem? Obviously, you'd give him the higher ad because of his uh, VA. You might need more magnification. His macular degeneration. Might go. Right, patient has macular degeneration with mild cataracts. Now, obviously, if you've got macular degeneration, this is central vision. And personally, you're wasting your time even prescribing uh, progressives. Now, um, I wouldn't recommend PALs at all. I'd rather give him two pairs or maybe even three pairs for intermediate or whatever. Now, there again, you may think uh, this is an exaggerated case. It's not. This actually happened. So just certain things that you may not have um, considered, um, just think interpret your script, interpret the patient completely before you decide. So that's the whole purpose of this exercise over here. And just to conclude on everything, <laughs> uh, I've only given you certain solutions. There may be other solutions to the problems, but the point of this year is interpret your script. Always try and anticipate if the patient's going to come back, why will he come back? There, as I mentioned, there may be other options not mentioned. The point of this article is for clinicians to understand, first of all, the basic optics of PALs, as this will make your job easier when prescribing. It's your basic understanding. When it comes to prescribing any prescription, it's always important to interpret your prescription carefully before selecting frames. As you saw with that uh, anisometropic patient, if you didn't interpret that properly, you would have thought otherwise. I mean, you wouldn't have known what the problem could be. With PALs, patient selection is always important. PALs do not suit everyone. Always think of alternate options that may not be in the textbook. Now, when I say alternate options, you would have noticed I mentioned um, an intermediate near bifocal. With you, if, you, if you're prescribing an intermediate near bifocal, there's no peripheral distortion. Any disadvantage maybe would be that slight jump effect from going from intermediate to near. 
if fitted correctly, best performance of PALs will be obtained. So no matter what PAL you are prescribing, you fit it correctly, you will get the best performance. Whether you fit in the cheapest or the most expensive, fit them properly, you will not get better, a better performance than, than that. And an important thing, never ever hand out PALs over the counter or allow others to collect them. If you do do that, don't be surprised if the patient comes back because they have not been educated properly. And on that happy note, I think I'll...